Okay, hi everyone. Um, we are happy to have this uh, webinar with uh, Dr. Stephen uh, Voldman. So as probably most of you are, are know, uh, I, I first time Shachar Kvatinsky from the Technion. I'm uh, heading the ACRC, the Advanced Circuits Research Center. Usually what we're doing is courses, uh, physical courses, uh, and we luckily we succeeded in February to have uh, the last course before uh, the coronavirus uh, took over our life. Uh, so we are now starting a new series of webinars. We plan to have a weekly webinar uh, and this way we'll continue to do some, uh, some activities and take advantage of uh, uh, what we can in the, the field of circuits in order to continue to perform training for the Israeli industry and academia. And so I'm very happy that the first uh, webinar will, will be with, uh, with uh, Stephen. And this webinar will be about ESD. And next week on uh, Thursday, we will have another webinar about power management. Um, and we will soon uh, uh, advertise all the webinars that are planned. We have a really uh, interesting uh, uh, program, at least until June. Um, and with that, I think that uh, Dr. Voltman is probably the world leading expert in ESD, so we are all very excited to have him and looking forward to for this uh, interesting uh, webinar. So, Stephen, the floor is yours. And I guess you need to unmute yourself because I muted everyone. Ah. I see unmute all, but I don't see unmute me. Now, now we can hear you. Yeah. Oh, you can. Okay. Well, shalom, shalom. Thank you for the invitation to uh, give this talk. Uh, uh, it's difficult for me to give a one-hour talk since I'm used to teaching uh, full-day courses in this subject. So I, I apologize if this is too simplistic, but I had to assume that uh, most people have a little experience with ESD. And uh, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of a sampler of uh, the subject. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the evolution of circuitry and chip, and chip architecture and I'm gonna give you a taste of digital CMOS, uh, a, a little bit of analog, uh, silicon and insulator technology, uh, silicon germanium and RF circuit applications. So uh, if you're unfamiliar with my work, I uh, wrote a, a book series on ESD. So these are some samples from the book series, but the book series uh, uh, different books focused on different aspects of ESD, some on physics, some on circuits, some on RF circuits, uh, floor planning, failure mechanisms, um, analog design, and etc. So um, uh, there's enough material for many day courses. Uh, I've taught in Tower Semiconductor before and in, in Tel Aviv. Um, so, okay, so we're gonna get going and uh, sorry if the depth is not significant. I have to assume most people don't have experience and I'm gonna give you a little bit of history, give you a little bit about design, some physics, some circuits, and uh, some on uh, technology evolution. So shalom, shalom. I'm glad to uh, give this talk. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about ESD protection, but the, the ESD evolution uh, uh, evolved uh, synergistically with uh, the technology roadmap of CMOS and the, 
CMOS technology roadmap interacted with establishing an SOI roadmap and an RF technology. Uh, I've been doing ESD work since, uh, even though I've been in technology since 19, 1980, uh, a lot of my ESD work uh, started in uh, the 1990s and forward. So I'm sorry if some of the stuff seems a little bit dated, but it's going to give you a taste for what the evolution was and how it started. Um, ESD protection uh, levels uh, 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 basically will decrease with CMOS scaling. But what was happening at the same time, uh, there was area scaling at devices and evolution of the technology. Uh, there was many evolutionary changes in CMOS technology, which actually I happened to be fortunately there when all this was happening. Everything from uh, substrate doping concentrations, uh, N-well design, epitaxy design, uh, psilocytes. Pardon? Um, all, what also happened was the evolution of the source drains, uh, gate dielectrics, and then the back end. Um, and then in the 1990s, uh, uh, technology started focusing on uh, silicon and insulator technology. Uh, just to give you a sense for what was happening with technologies, sorry about the date, uh, but going from 2000, you can see that the gate oxide was getting thinner and it keeps getting thinner. Uh, actually, uh, this is showing at about 20 nanometers is uh, where it was, but as the oxide thin, uh, thins, the breakdown voltage of the oxide goes down. Um, fortunately, the uh, advancement of the circuits allowed continual scaling of the dielectrics without significant problems. So you don't really hear about ESD problems with gate dielectrics, but that's because uh, behind the scenes, the circuits are being developed. So in the 1970s to 1980s, uh, there were very few ESD solutions existed in corporations. Uh, independent of the corporation, very few people had any solutions whatsoever. Uh, fundamentally, uh, the semiconductor industry was behind. Uh, uh, it was sort of like uh, they did not know how to react to the fact that uh, technology was basically uh, uh, scaling and no one was prepared for uh, ESD protection solutions at that time. Uh, there was no circuits, there were no power clamps, there were no architecture, there was very little test site development, uh, there were no design rules. Uh, there were no design manuals. There were no checking rules. Uh, there was little failure analysis. There was some, but usually just didn't teach much. Uh, the testing industry, uh, there were very few testers at the time. There were very few standards. So in early days, uh, there were, uh, and then the other thing is the one or two corporations that was advancing with their circuits, uh, kept them as secrets and would not allow other corporations to see what they were doing. So there was a tendency to use it as uh, corporate secrets and not released. Uh, in that early time frame too, there was no books. So there was no way to learn and the quality of the publications were limited. Uh, the ESD Association was founded in 1979 so the sort of first open sets of publications were coming in that time frame. Uh, all that changed. So in the 1980s to 1990 time frame, uh, uh, there were significant advancements in circuit design, power clamps, uh, chip architecture, test site development, uh, rule development, checking rules, a lot more failure analysis uh, and that there was more development of ESD standards. Uh, at the early days, there was only a human body model and there was only about one standard that was suitable. Uh, and the interesting thing is the human body model standard did not come from the semiconductor industry. It came from, if you go back in history, 
it came from Colorado School of Mines because basically the early focus on human body model was, believe it or not, uh, explosives uh, and was not semiconductors. So some of the early work was not even really done in the semiconductor industry. It came from, uh, believe it or not, the mine development. Uh, if you look at these early years, in 1980, the human body model, HBM, results were really low, uh, 500 volts, 1,000 volts. Um, and there was very little solutions. Uh, early corporations that took a good, a large interest in ESD protection was Texas Instrument uh, and uh, Intel. Uh, Intel didn't really get going, didn't even have an employee working on ESD protection in 1984. Um, uh, on the other hand, Texas Instrument that was doing a lot of military work started introducing uh, a lot more employees on ESD protection. And what started happening was the results started to improve as we incorporated better devices, smarter circuits. So a lot of the advancement was because of, uh, up to 2000 was because of the improvements in circuits and understanding. Uh, there were more physicists that were introduced to basically start understanding the uh, power to failure, uh, protection circuits, and the development of physical models. Uh, if you look at some of the early history, it was actually the US military uh, publications from national labs that started having an advancement in physical models and stuff. And this was kept improving up to 2000. By around 1995, 2000, the results were still climbing up because we were getting smarter. There was more things introduced. Um, so here's an example of the IBM uh, innovation roadmap. Uh, and basically this is the back end. Uh, and what happened is uh, there's two, uh, the lower line is the transistor innovations and the wiring innovations. And basically what happens is uh, a lot of people didn't realize it, but as technology evolved and every time there was a new innovation in both the transistor level, the substrate, and even the wiring, every single physical advancement in the semiconductor industry influenced the uh, ESD protection level. And people didn't see it that way in the beginning because they weren't really thinking about it. They were focusing on scaling and density and uh, process development. But every one of those technological advancements changed the ESD protection level. And this is a shot of the uh, IBM profile showing the advancement uh, from aluminum to uh, bulk silicon to copper interconnects and locate and silicon on insulator and strain silicon and um, other technology technological advancement. There was also evolution of testing. The ESD um, uh, uh, testing industry, uh, as more and more tests were developed, uh, they started learning more and more about the failure mechanisms. There was they introduced a lot more models, and there was a focus on two new areas as well, uh, transmission line pulse testing, and then eventually very fast uh, transmission line pulse testing. Um, the TLP and VFTLP were important steps because unfortunately, human body model, HBM, machine model, MM, charge device model, didn't really give circuit designers an understanding of what was really happening. You tested the results, you saw the failure levels, and that's where the, your understanding stopped. But the transition to TLP and VFTLP, which was introduced, uh, actually helped significantly because this allowed circuit designers to see the actual uh, current and voltage across devices, trigger conditions, et cetera. Um, more recently, so there was a lot of early focus on electrostatic discharge protection of components. Separately, there was system level testing going on on products. And the product level tests 
of interest was known as the IEC 61000-4-2. And then there's another one, which is a surge protection, IEC 61004-5. And new standards were developed uh, to basically take the system level test and apply it to the products. Now, unfortunately, the system level people did not really communicate well with the chip development people. They were working parallel in different committees, and yet they didn't really deal with the fact of the effect of chip failure on system levels. And if you talk to the system level engineers and test engineers, they'll tell you that the, system, the things that lead to system level failures were typically the semiconductor chips. So it's only in recent years, about the last uh, five to 15 years, was there a focus on testing of system level like tests applied to semiconductor chip components. Uh, one of these is called the human metal model. Uh, normally I'll teach a whole course on testing, but today we're just gonna touch on it. But just to give you a sense for what was going on in the testing evolution, uh, I don't have dates on this, but basically what happened was in the early days, there was a human body model test with the standard was continually being worked on for about 15 years. Then there was an introduction of the machine model test, which came in from the Japanese, which was basically uh, the human body model test is, uh, is 100 uh, phenofarads, a pico, 100 picofarad capacitor with 1,500 ohm resistor. Machine model test is almost is no resistor, uh, and it's 200 picofarad capacitance. Uh, the next important test that affected the semiconductor industry was the charge device model test (CDM). The CDM test was first basically worked on by AT&T and Intel. Uh, AT&T was dealing with it because they were dealing with phone lines, and the communication industry was leading to uh, chip level failure. So there was a teams of people, uh, significantly large teams at AT&T and Bell in ESD protection because they were having a lot of problems with telephone lines, cables, and pulses coming into the chips. Uh, on the other hand, on the chip side, there was uh, the charge device model work was being done at Intel. And one of the reasons Intel was dealing with it first was because uh, the charge device model problem gets worse with bigger chips. And because Intel at that time had the largest chips in the industry from the microprocessors, they're one of the first people to start having this problem. Uh, but also there were other tests. Now the other tests in this picture, a lot of them are not standards. There was something called the uh, small charge model. Uh, some people know this as the Nintendo model the gaming industry from uh, small game, uh, gaming chips are also seeing failures. And then there was also the cable uh, uh, charge board event where basically it was a board lowered the charge device. It's like a composite of a chip and a board together being pulsed and discharged. There's something called the charge board event. Uh, who was interested in, and still interested in the charge board event? The cell phone industry. So you'll see a lot of the early work was areas that um, uh, companies in countries that were developing cell phones. Uh, the transmission line pulse testing was started in America and that basically the VFTLP. If you look at uh, people's publications, uh, they think that TLP testing actually started in the 1990s. But in reality, in the 1980s, there were people that were doing military work. Uh, uh, Whalen from the University of Buffalo that was doing TLP and BFTLP testing as early as, uh, in, well, actually it was 1979. So some of the TLP routes actually go back to the early start of work on uh, ESD protection testing. Uh, and then what I showed additionally on this is more focus on the uh, uh, system level tests. And there was some work done by at Stanford uh, 
uh, an ultra-fast TLP. Uh, there was a, a, a graduate student that built a tester that was testing things at about 40, p, uh, 40 picosecond uh, uh, time frames. So the TLP test was 100 nanoseconds, VFT was 10 nanosecond pulses, and then there was something known as the ultra-fast TLP. Uh, there was a student that worked at Stanford that uh, basically built the first uh, UFTLP test. So one thing you can see is by over time, more and more models were developed looking for different types of failure mechanisms and improved reliability. Uh, one of the biggest problems is expense. How many tests are you gonna do to launch a product in the industry? Okay, here's an example. I'm gonna talk first about a little bit about CMOS and CMOS circuits. Um, uh, this is an example of uh, electroconstriction in 1993, and what you're looking at is an atomic force microscope mapping uh, of uh, a failure mechanism in a MOSFET. Uh, the chip actually was the PowerPC 603 in 1993 timeframe, and actually this is the first image of using an atomic force microscope. Uh, I had uh, fortunate access to this because of the inventors in IBM Switzerland, and we started collaborating on using some of the advanced uh, failure analysis tools. So over time, with the advancement over the many years, uh, the advancement of uh, diagnostics and failure analysis, more and more tools were being applied to ESD, and this helped progress the learning. Oh, let's start talking about some circuits. Uh, I, I'm gonna have limited depth on this because it will take the whole day to talk about it. Uh, but basically different corporations chose different paths. Uh, some of the key circuits that people use, uh, an early circuit used was the grounded gate MOSFET. It was just the, the drain of the MOSFET was connected to the input node. The source was connected to, or the, the, the source was connected to the input node. The drain was connected to ground, and the gate was connected to the ground rail. This is called grounded gate. It's like some people call this GGN MOS. This had a lot of popularity in Texas Instrument and in Europe. Uh, other corporations, uh, as myself in Intel and uh, RF applications, used what was known as the dual diode uh, ESD protection circuit. Uh, other corporations introduced silicon controlled rectifiers. Each one of these uh, circuits uh, had pros and cons. Uh, one of the disadvantage of MOSFETs is that the circuit, as the MOSFET evolved, uh, uh, as the MOSFET evolved in time, uh, one had to change the ESD protection circuit, which evolved with the technology. Uh, they also did things like ESD implants, where it had to swamp out the uh, low dope drains, which impacted the ESD results. They also had to introduce stripping off the psilocytes, because the psilocytes also lowered the results. The other problem with having an ESD protection circuit that's a MOSFET is it's in the design point of the MOSFET. Uh, the beauty of the dual diode uh, circuit is it's scaled with technologies, especially as the isolation went from low-cost isolation to shell trans isolation. And uh, basically, as the technology scaled, it was able to be migrated. Uh, corporations that used uh, MOSFETs required a large population of employees to do this work. Also was introduced was the silicon controlled rectifier. The silicon controlled rectifier uh, uh, the beauty of it is it's got high uh, ESD protection and robustness, uh, but one of the significant problems was uh, that SCRs can uh, basically undergo latch up. Uh, uh, also what happened is uh, in my, well, I'll give an example. So this is what a grounded gate MOSFET uh, circuit looked like. It's very simple, it was thin oxide and um, it was thin oxide results. So the failure of this mechanism, the failure of this circuit uh, 
the failure of the circuit was a result of um, the snapback voltage of the MOSFET, which was a function of the channel length, and the and gate dielectric breakdown, uh, a drain to gate. Uh, so as the circuits evolved, this breakdown voltage went, uh, went down and things had to be adjusted. Uh, corporations that had to use ground to gate, I, I once had a friend of mine who was working at, uh, uh, on the alpha chip and he had all these uh, MOSFET based ESD protections. And one day I was uh, working with him when there was collaboration uh, of companies and he sat in my office and he says, I never understood why you use diodes. He says, I've been working on a grounded gate FET circuit. And I finally figured out that basically every time I change the technology, I got to redo all my work. So uh, the complexity of this was uh, uh, the effort that has to be put in. Another circuit that was first introduced was just using two diodes and um, uh, the first two diodes on the left. When it, once CMOS was introduced, you had a P plus N well diode uh, going up to BDD as a first diode. And to ground, you could use an N diffusion or you could use an N well. Uh, this sometimes had a resistor in series. And then this was followed by a, some people refer to as a, a second stage projection circuit. And this was for Charge, introduced for the charge device model, because basically uh, the you needed a diode local to the uh, input node. This is an example of a silicon controlled rectifier. Um, in the case where it's a CMOS technologies, these are parasitic devices, and you need to tune this device in order to have it turn on. But the thing is you need to have this not to turn on below the power supply voltage, and you have to make sure that this thing doesn't latch up when the device is fired up. Here's an example of what you may need to do in order to protect a standard CMOS inverter. Um, what you're seeing is a pass transistor. With the introduction of a pass transistor, this low, lowered the VT of the device. And as a result, the uh, lowering of the VT led that you needed to introduce a keeper circuit. So this introduced a low one, putting the feed, uh, the one was then converted to a zero. A PFET was then used to pull the zero up to a good one to have a good output signal coming out of the device. As receivers evolved, uh, the pass transistors had to be introduced. Uh, what you're looking at though is an invention that I uh, introduced into the Motorola IBM PowerPC and I had to introduce what was known as a keeper well bias control network. Because what would happen is that when the node would go high and the power supply was grounded during ESD testing, the uh, drain of the PFET would forward bias and lead to pinning of the uh, node and lead to failure. So for ESD protection, sometimes you have to change the circuit topology in order to maintain protection. Uh, I had an example of a, a customer who introduced the keeper on the circuit and the receiver protection levels went down to 2,500 volts. I then showed him, I told him, why don't you cut it off? You don't need to add that right now. Next thing you know, the results went up to 7,000 volts. So sometimes a simple feedback element can drop the ESD protection of a receiver by 5,000 volts. And by introducing of this device, the results went back up to normal. Um, if you go to my book on ESD circuits, there's chapters on this subject matter. What was also introduced in the early stages in the early 1980s was what was known as ESD power clamps. ESD power clamps, there's all kinds of tastes and flavors. Um, uh, but there's, some are native voltage, some are mixed voltage, some are integrated trigger circuits, master, master slaves. And then there's different types of triggers. There's frequency triggering, there's voltage triggering, there are some circuits that do uh, frequency and voltage, and then some of these voltage triggered, some can be reverse biased, some can be forward biased. So there's a large family of power circuit, uh, power clamp circuits. Uh, let me show you the most 
uh, this circuit right here, an example of probably the most commonly used device. It was used throughout the entire industry, especially in the CMOS world. Uh, and what you needed to do was have an RC discriminator on the left-hand side, which would respond to the human, uh, human body model pulse. The signal would then be propagated across three inverters and fed into a very large device on the output stage. The output stage was typically, uh, so instead of the device just breaking down, which is like what happens is in the grounded gate NMOS, it's not dependent on the physics. It, it basically, you turn the gate on, which then turns the entire device. The beauty of this device is it scales with device width. And the fact is you can put 20 of them on a chip and spread them out across the power distribution in order to maintain protection levels. There's another way to do it is that you have one trigger known as the master trigger, and then you can have segments of this, these regions all distributed across the whole chip. Uh, corporations like Maxim uses this strategy. Uh, the one downside of this device is that you have to make sure that you're turning on all these devices uh, in parallel. Second thing is just the routing, the extra routing to get the signal around. Uh, another example of a power clamp, some people use the silicon controlled rectifier as an as a, uh, input ESD protection, but also what was common was using them uh, the power, as a power clamp for the power grid. Uh, this is more common than using them on the input circuits. Uh, many corporations did this and what happens depending on your technology and the tuning of these devices, uh, basically the success level varied. Okay, what other things? When I was working in Silicon Germanium, I used two NPNs. When you have a bi CMOS technology, you might have three different uh, transistors that you can use. Uh, and what in this, oops, let me go back. In this circuit, basically, I had a trigger device, which was a Silicon Germanium NPN. Silicon Germanium NPN uh, has a breakdown voltage. High frequency uh, silicon germanium NPN has a, a low breakdown voltage. If it, if it has a low breakdown voltage, then this would turn on prior to the clamping device. On the output device, I use the low frequency uh, silicon germanium transistor, which has a higher uh, breakdown voltage. And if you know your early theory, there was a public something known as the Johnson limit breakdown voltage times uh, trigger uh, frequency, a unity current uh, cutoff frequency is equal to the uh, maximum electric field times the saturation velocity divided by two pi. So these circuits actually fit the physical theory of the Johnson limit equation and are very successful in bipolar applications. What do I do about between rails? Well, what happens is the architecture also has a significant uh, effect. Uh, early, dig, uh, early chips and digital uh, uh, analog designers were concerned about the effect of the noise from the digital circuitry on the few analog circuits in a, a digital dominated uh, uh, microprocessor, for example. Um, and what are some of the analog circuits? Uh, sometimes they were receivers, sometimes they were phase lock loops, uh, PLLs, DLLs. And circuit designers didn't want the noise of the digital circuitry to affect the analog, so they set up separate power grids. The problem is when they introduce separate, independent, isolated analog uh, VDD analog ground, what ended up happening was uh, there would be failures in the analog, uh, ESD failures in the analog sector. So in order to partially reconnect them with uh, basically some level of noise buffers, um, uh, ESD protection circuits were added to the grid in uh, domain, domain ESD protection circuits. When I get into analog applications, uh, there's a lot of things, all the, all the concepts of analog uh, circuitry are introduced. Uh, all the issues, uh, linearity, 
um, uh, matching, etc., were needed to deal with introducing ESD uh, protection in analog circuits. Um, all the concepts of analog design can be introduced into the ESD protection circuitry. Uh, I, I have a book that specifically focuses on uh, analog ESD protection, common centroid techniques, where you basically uh, introduce a matching, uh, use common centroid to uh, match the devices. Another thing some of the early analog corporations introduced, like uh, analog devices, uh, they didn't want the effect of the isolation to affect the uh, ESD protection circuitry or design. So they introduced a uh, circular design. So here is an example of uh, a layout of an actual chip in, uh, ESD protection introduced. Well, how did they introduce these? Well, what they did was they wanted to cut down the capacitance of the bond pad for RF circuitries, and they cut off the corners of the bond pad. In the corners of the circuits, they put these round ESD devices. They could put in four, and they could put one in each corner. When they put one in each, if they have a, in fact, what they even did was establish a concept where they had for a digital circuit, they added four of them. For performance reasons, for analog, uh, they only use two of them. And then for RF applications, they only used one. So they really had, let's call three different protection level standards for the different types of circuit in uh, analog circuits where you had digital, analog, and RF in a common chip. Another thing introduced was basically octagonal devices, which also fit into the corner of devices. Uh, they, these were smaller structures. And one of the problems with the circular and uh, octagonal devices is if you have to use like a cadence uh, system, these designs don't uh, grow easily uh, for, uh, in the parameterized cells and uh, are a little, uh, sometimes you have to run with fixed design sizes. Uh, so as we talked about, when you get into mixed signal, you got digital and analog power and ground are separate. They, uh, play, the digital and analog ESD are placed between the rails and they're placed uh, between the analog and digital domains. And sometimes the park and the power clamps can be placed in the corners. So here's an example of a floor plan of a mixed signal chip. Uh, what you can see on the upper part of the chip I have two digital ESD power clamps in the corner. The uh, horseshoe around the digital circuitry is the digital power rails. Uh, then you have an analog section. Notice that the digital and analog circuitry are separated into different domains within the chip. The analog power rail is then connected to the analog ESD power, power rails. Uh, the crossover point between digital and analog there's a DVSS to AVSS ESD protection between the different rails of the chips in order to, like the circuit that we showed before. Uh, additional, which I don't have labeled in this plot, you need to have a moat. So for example, if I have a D to A circuitry, the D to A circuits cross that domain and in this uh, physical region. And you keep the, and sometimes uh, the corporations might have a moat, which is 50 to 100 micron space between the two circuits to use the separate domains. Uh, also in these kind of architectures, you don't have low resistance substrates. They're very resistive substrates to prevent the noise propagation. Another thing that came up more recently is uh, interdomain or ESD failures between the two sides. Uh, so for the first time uh, historically, we had to start introducing what's called internal ESD protection. Uh, for example, what you're looking at is, uh, is a domain where you have on the left a VDD1, which is digital. The current flows to the VDD. It flows down through the uh, PFET uh, driver circuit, goes through the signal line. Then what happens is it introduces a voltage across the uh, uh, pull-down end-fet of the analog receiver. Uh, this leads to ESD failures. 
uh, since the discovery of this, first thing is people introduce circuits to fix it. The second thing is design systems actually had to basically develop ways to look for these, uh, let's call crossover signal lines, which went from one side of the domain to the other and document that uh, which lines were doing this. So one of the solutions actually for this was introduction of a resistor to uh, basically lower the voltage between the uh, 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 node of the pull down gate and also introduce a grounded gate NFET. So it's a resistor NFET. Now what this is, it acts as a voltage divider because um, this has a certain resistance. When this turns on, the, uh, uh, when the grounded gate NFET turns on, it has a certain series resistance. The series resistance then sets up a voltage division, uh, keeping the voltage down on the receiver node. Uh, this was one solution. Now, high-speed designers don't like this solution because of the loading effect of the FET and also the resistance. Uh, Gene Worley, from, uh, uh, he's at Qualcomm now, he introduced another concept. And what he did was figure out how do you drop the voltage down? And what he introduced was uh, basically what he calls a third party uh, system where the signal coming in on the left has to go through an inverter drop down and then a second inverter drop down. And so the signal coming in as a one gets inverted as a zero, which then gets re-inverted as a one coming out. And what you can see is also uh, three diode voltage drops between VSS1 and VSS2. Uh, the beauty of this design, this has pros and cons. Uh, the downside of this is it creates a delay, but it's an inverter delay signal, which is not much. And it's an improved, uh, improvement on the no, no uh, impact because of the loading. So this, this is used by uh, Qualcomm and other uh, uh, high-speed uh, corporations and it's, uh, this was developed by Gene Worley, who used to be with Rockwell, but now he's with Qualcomm. Uh, so this is another popular solution. So you can see that basically, uh, as this, the integration of uh, chips to uh, digital, to digital analog, to mixed signal, uh, you know, with the introduction of different uh, chip sectors combined on the same chip, new issues occur in the substrate and signal lines. We're, uh, I'm going to switch over to silicon on insulator to keep moving. A silicon on insulator technology was introduced in the 1960s and 70s for mostly for space applications. Uh, guess what? CMOS was introduced uh, for space applications too. Uh, the original CMOS technology was called Cosmos uh, by RCA. Uh, why did people introduce SOI? Uh, one is single event latch up. Uh, another is a soft error rate from uh, high, heavily, heavy, heavy ion particles and low leakage and cosmic ray uh, effects in space. Uh, but it was realized that one of the advantages of SOI was the elimination of the uh, source strain capacitances of a MOSFET. So about 1980 uh, time frame. Uh, Chen Ming Hu and Minson Chan wrote a paper on the concept of CMOS evolution to SOI. And, and when they showed this publication, this scared everyone because the reduction of the ESD protection levels was about, it was 50%. So there was a belief that if you migrate from base CMOS to SOI, that you're going to take a reduction in the ESD protection level of the products. So to mainstream SOI, uh, IBM started working in 1990s, actually spent 10 years figuring out how to go from migrating its microprocessors into SOI technology. Uh, other corporations jumped on the bandwagon a little bit later, but uh, my work was from this time frame from 1991 to 2000. Um, and basically what we were doing was developing the SOI ESD protection circuitry so that there wouldn't be a reduction. Uh, the first introduced CPU uh, in Apple and IBM uh, about 2000. 
So one of the things that had to be introduced was new protection devices. Uh, since there was no vertical diet, people were paranoid that there would be no protection results. But if you take a MOSFET gate, uh, on the left side is an NFET, on the right side is a PFET, you can build a P plus N minus N plus lateral uh, diode structure in, uh, for, this, uh, for this device. And you drop the gate down the middle, you drop the mass down the middle, so it's a PFET on one side and an NFET on the other. Um, here's an example of this actual structure. You can see the discoloration of the gate on the left side is because of it's a P diffusion. So the gate didn't land exactly in the middle. And it's the example of one of the devices used. Uh, here's an example of the layout that was used on the microprocessor. And what you're looking at is a dual diode structure. The reason there's all this empty space around it is with silicon insulator technology, you can significantly scale the size of the ESD protection circuits to be significantly lower. Uh, now, with that extra area that you just gave, uh, gave up, you can build bigger ESD protection circuits in the SOI than bulk, because you eliminated all the ground rules to guard rings and everything else. And there's no advantage to having a wide area protection device because this device is all perimeter driven. Uh, so over, so look at the speeds of these microprocessors, they're slow. So in the early days, what happened is we found that the, uh, we could start building SOI devices, but it took some time and learning to uh, build better devices to get the results up in bulk. Uh, and these are examples from products that 0.2 micron technology, 0.15, 0.12, where we were building them in bulk, then remapping them in silicon insulator. And what happened is with the scaling of technologies, the results are coming down. But we were doing almost 10,000 volt uh, ESD protection levels in silicon and insulator. Uh, this was a surprise to the corporation. Nobody anticipated the results were gonna be this good. Uh, also in SOI, you can introduce uh, innovations. Um, for example, Here's an example, I won't go into too long, dynamic threshold MOSFETs, DTMOS MOSFETs. Uh, uh, ironically, IBM uh, hired uh, Faraborz Sadoregi, who was working on uh, DTOMS transistors, and I realized I could introduce this into the protection level. So in 1997, I built this device, which is basically, uh, you can see the NPN laterally, uh, the gate surrounded, and N plus source on the outside. Um, and um, this was some of the directions I was trying. So here's an example of a transmission line pulse testing uh, results, uh, the driver by itself, an SOI driver. And then you can see with the introduction of three different versions of a the DTMOS SOI device uh, that I could get a lower turn on of the device and higher higher protection levels. Um, so let's see, this was 97. One problem though is that the devices we're building in SOI are the, the film, the SOI is getting thinner. So uh, corporations like AMD started saying, you know what, it's getting thinner, uh, the, S the thin film is getting thinner and thinner the ESD protection level, the series resistance is gonna to be too high. Uh, they took the effort in AMD to build uh, using five mass, cut through the buried oxide and went back to the bulk. So people played with the idea of if you can't build a good ESD device in SOI, build it back in the bulk substrate. And what you're looking at here is the lower curve is the protection level uh, in the SOI film. And then the uh, red triangles is the improvement by going back to the bulk. Um, so was there an expense to this? Yes. Uh, was it used by everybody in industry? I don't think so. But it shows you that innovation can be, uh, in, in an SOI technology, you can build the devices in the bulk or in the SOI film. So the new direction things are going are FinFETs. 
And these are all examples of where things are going from double gate, triple gate, nug cuts. And there's still little work done on uh, ESD protection in these devices. Here's an early, how early did they exist? Uh, here's an example from the Japanese who are introducing these kind of devices for DRAMs. Uh, what do they look like? Uh, the, you have a fin, you have a gate that wraps up and down the side of the device, a source and a drain. Uh, here's some examples from Christian Roos, who was one of the first people to start doing ESD protection on FinFET devices. Uh, the st structure on the left shows the device. You can see the uh, sources, uh, the channels on the left side and the gate structure. And then the right plot shows the device after uh, ESD uh, failure. And what you can see is that the ESD failure of this device took out like one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven parallel channels. So one of the in interesting things on this whole problem is that the electrocurrent constriction gets broken up in the different channels and actually leads to a distribution of the failure across many of the uh, FinFET channels. Here's some experimental results and they played around with the size and dimensions and the number of channels, the number of fins. And you can see, can you use a FinFET for ESD protection? Yes. Here's an example where they're using it as a, a grounded gate MFET, but actually the gate's not grounded, the gate's tied high and where they're turning on the device as a MOSFET. Here's an example where the device is used as a, a diode, a diode configured device. Can you use it as an EST protection? Yes. So the migration to FinFETs is not a deterrent from achieving ESD protection, but there is, since it's a new structure, there is significant learning that has to go on. Uh, here's an example of the diode configured and you can't see the channels are blown out. Uh, for RF devices, uh, RF, it's a whole different world when you get into ESD protection and RF applications. Uh, in, in 2000, there was almost no solutions to provide ESD protection in RF devices. Um, the interesting thing is when you're dealing with CMOS technology, the ESD pulses were considered fast because the speeds of the ESD pulses were from or up to five, five gigahertz frequencies. But when you're dealing with RF circuitry, uh, especially silicon germanium, the, uh, the FTs of silicon germanium devices can be 47 gigahertz, 100, 120, 200, and 300. So as a result, the ESD pulses are slow. The beauty of this is now you can use all the RF techniques you need. The other thing that's interesting is you have to start viewing the ESD protection from an RF perspective. Uh, here is an example. An ideal ESD protection is a device that has zero impedance in the ESD regime and in uh, high frequencies, let's call greater than five gigahertz, is infinite. Uh, capacitors have a decreasing uh, because of one over J omega C as a decreasing impedance. Resistors are flat, which is also not favorable. So it was found that the best ESD protection solution is introduction of inductors into the ESD protection circuits. Um, let's go past this. What also happened is with the introduction of RF devices, we had to introduce uh, RF models for all the devices. Now here's an example, example of a cadence-based RF design system that I developed, um, and which basically had the first time ESD protection circuits had RF models uh, and were growable and could change the impedance on the fly. Here's an example of a back-to-back -back diode string and what I introduced into a cadence library. Um, what else? Floor planning. Same thing as the digital analog, you can introduce an RF. Uh, when I worked with a design team that did this, they took the metalization levels, uh, all the levels, and made a cage 
had openings in the cage where the signal lines went through the cage from the analog to the RF sector. And this was a circuit chip that was about 10% RF, was called 20% analog, about 70% digital. And there are products that were developed. And again, just like a mixed signal, you have to uh, distribute the architectures with separate rails, spatially separated, introductions of moats, uh, and other things to separate the noise. There's also narrowband and broadband circuits. Uh, there was a lot of work done by uh, Ming Dao Kerr in Taiwan of introducing LC tanks where the uh, square root of uh, where the application frequency of the LC tank was equal to the resonant frequency. Um, uh, and that way, there are infinite impedance and you don't see the loading effect of the diodes. Another technique for broadband was apply uh, RF broadband uh, uh, circuit distribution, where you have like a transmission line of an inductor, load, inductor, load, and such a way that at high frequencies, you don't see the effect of the multiple stages. Uh, this is an example of a silicon germanium transistor. Uh, to, this is an example of uh, transmission line pulse testing measurements, which gives you, provides a lot of information. Uh, this is an example of what's known as a winch bell curve, uh, comparing the silicon germanium the heterojunction bipolar transistor to the silicon BJT, and you can see that silicon germanium transistor actually outperforms. Uh, and what you're looking at is the critical current to failure as a function of the pulse width. And we sort of introduced this one before. This is the trigger voltage. And after silicon germanium, how do you make a silicon germanium transistor go faster? You introduce boron by, or carbon. By introducing carbon into the boron prevents the out diffusion, which allows you to build smaller device widths. So with uh, students from Princeton University and some new hires, uh, we started looking at the comparison of carbon, silicon germanium carbon and uh, silicon uh, ESD device, uh, silicon germanium. What was interesting was as anticipated, introducing a carbon controlled the base width of the silicon germanium transistor and led to higher results. Uh, the interesting thing is the, uh, in the white circles are silicon carbon. Uh, even the ESD protection levels were higher in the faster speed devices than the silicon germanium. So the silicon germanium carbon transistors are typically uh, 100, 100 gigahertz FT and typically the silicon germaniums are uh, 47 to 90 um, uh, frequencies. So the beauty of this is that you get higher speed results produce ESD results that are still higher. Uh, and also you can really start looking significantly at the, a lot of the physics. Here's an example of uh, measurements I took with a graduate student. And we basically looked at the unity current cutoff frequency versus a collector current, looking at the FTIC characteristic and seeing how the transistors degrade as we pulsed it. So just to, sorry about the speed of some of the slides, but uh, I just wanted to give you a, a little bit of a taste. The ESD protection has been a challenge. Uh, it's Went, had a tremendous amount of development went into this. If you go to the ESD symposium documents, there are about 40 years worth of publications. Uh, there is also significant, uh, in the 1990s, there was one book on ESD protection. Uh, there are now about 20 books introduced to teach you how to do it. Um, it went through significant amount of innovations, circuits, education, documents, standards, committees, et cetera, to achieve the present results we have today. Uh, so it's a whole discipline in itself. Um, and it still continues to be a problem. Uh, future nanostructures are still gonna be a challenge with scaling, problem doesn't go away. And some of the focus is changing more towards electrical overstress and latch up in other areas. 
So you're going to see the entire field sort of shift. And so I think, thank you very much. I want to thank Masha Schuster from ACRC who helped set this up. And I want to thank the ACRC uh, Technion for uh, sponsoring this presentation. And to the Rabat. Stephen, thank you very much. I think that we'll do questions with the uh, hand raising, right? I think that people can raise their hands or symbol that like in reactions. Do you see it? Uh, yeah, I see it. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so regarding uh, cross-domain uh, ESD challenges, especially as chips become uh, very large uh, integrations and large packages, uh, I see two uh, approaches. One is the back-to-back -back diets that you described, and another one is the cross-domain clamps. Uh, Correct. Clamp between VDD1 to VSS2 and between VSS1 to VDD2. Can you say what are the advantages or disadvantages of each one of them, which one is better, or a okay. combination of both of them? There, there's multiple solutions. Uh, one, people, uh, one that people feel more safer with is to have a power clamp between VDD and VSS, digital, and then a second power clamp between analog VDD and VSS, and then the ground-to-ground -ground circuit, which I showed. There's another one that should, everyone play with, but I don't know who implemented it, is you can connect an ESD device between DVDD and AVSS, uh, and then you can go from uh, AVDD to, A, to DVSS. Um, uh, people have played with that, but I don't know anyone that has ever implemented it that I know of. And um, I would think that that could be a little trickier, especially, especially during power-up of chips. How do you keep those cross-domain uh, power clamps uh, from turning on when they don't, when you don't want them to turn on? Um, so there's multiple solutions and uh, different corporations have taken different paths. Uh, another one, uh, a straight over voltage, well, so, so you can have your normal power clamp where each one is in its own domain, and then you can have the ones that sort of go from one one uh, DVDD to AVSS. Uh, so yes, there's people that have done it. I can't, I can't speak to anyone I know that used it. Yeah, I didn't introduce that in the, in the lecture. Hello? Maybe you are unmuted, you can ask. Okay, thank you. Um, Maybe I think you are now muted again. Excuse me, can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Um, my, uh, two comments. One is, uh, um, what about spark gaps? Do you never mention anything about spark gaps? And, and the second question is, Gene Worley, I used to work with Gene Worley a long time ago, back in the early 80s. Um, so, can you please speak to, to spark gaps? You hear me? Did, did you hear me? We heard you, Steven. Hello, Steven. Yeah, Steven, you were um, muted also. Am I still muted? No. Now we can okay. hear you. Um, you know, there's a whole. I didn't get into it, but all the nanostructures. Uh, uh, if you look at some of my uh, uh, books and uh, publications. 
I get into the whole problem of nanostructures. And all I'm talking about like micro motors, micro mirrors, um, uh, micro and the Jeremy Walverin's work from Sandia Labs, uh, basically, uh, and mass development, photo mass, all those kind of structures introduce spark gaps when, when you, those are undesired spark gaps um, and they lead to problems. One of the problems is the damage. Uh, the, the, the spark itself leads, uh, melts the material uh, in the gap and leads to something known as stiction, where the, basically the devices stop working. So um, spark gaps are sort of unpredictable too. So, uh, you know, it all depends on the parameters, the, the bluntness of the uh, point, uh, the gap size, the dimension, the air. Uh, so I have not seen any, for electrical overstress, people use spark gaps sometimes as a first stage of protection. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, I've seen that, where you have a first stage of protection or it's a spark gap, which is for uh, electrical overstress. There's a whole host of EOS protection networks uh, that are used, uh, even circuit, almost like uh, circuit breakers, micro circuit breakers, et cetera, for those things. Uh, yes, that's a whole subject in itself. Uh, typically, typically, you don't see it on chip as the primary protection device or, or secondary. They may become more prevalent in future devices. We'll see. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, if you are in. Could you please uh, recommend a, a basic book uh, on uh, EFD pot, pot, uh, protection? <laughs> okay, I didn't want to add that. Uh, I've written uh, for the semiconductor in people's called job description. So I have the first book on ESD. It's also on going into the physics. The first book also goes into every module of the CMOS technology, uh, the substrate, the well, the junction, and all the, all the ESD results associated with every single uh, technology module. The second book, if you're interested in circuits, actually there's a second edition, it's a 600 page book on ESD circuits, um, which is all CMOS circuits, digital and things like that. The third book is if you're interested in RF technology. The RF technology book has uh, C uh, RF CMOS, silicon germanium, silicon germanium carbon, gallium arsenide, and some other things. Uh, I also have a book made for failure analysis engineers that don't like math, that don't like equations, that like pictures. So I have a failure analysis book. So if you go to John Wiley, uh, well, if you go to, if you go to uh, Amazon Google, if you type in my name, my full name, of all the different texts. Uh, there's a new book that's going to be coming out. Uh, it's a ESD handbook, which we wanted. It's, it's, big. it's about a thousand page book on supposedly to contain everything. Uh, but it's supposed to be like a, a best side handbook. So the, what, what is your interest? Can't hear. She's muted. Could you please uh, send us a, a, a brief uh, list of references? Yeah, I can. I Thank can send you. it to Mashi and she could distribute. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I see that there are 
additional questions, Avram Sayag? Hello, you hear yeah. me? Uh, I have a question. Uh, if my uh, power amplifier at, uh, output metric network is a transformer, I need to add uh, an another DSD uh, protection or, or, or it is enough? I, I, your, your speaker, I didn't really hear the first part of the question. I, I ask if uh, the uh, is is transformer. I need to add another another SD protection circuit, or it it, it is enough. Uh, your voice. Uh, I apologize. Your voice got jumbled. I couldn't hear it. Oh. Never mind. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, this is Harshit. I have a question on uh, the protection with the uh, inductors. So uh, we have seen in the past, like when we have protection with inductors, um, uh, typically uh, for CDM, uh, we see a very high uh, overshoot over the inductors, which uh, then sometimes uh, causes uh, damage on the LNAs. Um, so, uh, for um, uh, for such cases, uh, do we have any, um, uh, let's say, model available um, in literature which uh, we could use um, uh, to evaluate how much, uh, uh, let's say, voltage uh, will appear? Uh, because um, uh, we we cannot just treat the inductor as a as a, a metal resistance, right? Yeah. So uh, there's a whole uh, in order to understand the robustness of inductors, uh, there's two primary issues. First of all, um, the physics of the inductor is like understanding the robustness of wiring. So uh, depending on whether it's aluminum or copper um, will affect whether the uh, uh, the robustness of the wire. The second thing is also the design level. Uh, design levels are towards the top of the chip. Uh, so for example, if you have a RF metal or analog metal, the cross section is bigger. Uh, another thing too that causes inductor failure historically was the, uh, if it's like an inductor pair, the, uh, the crossover uh, point between the two inductors that drop to a lower level um, usually is the failure point. So I think that the solution also with inductors, if you wanna prevent inductor failure, is you introduce a parallel element like a diode in series to make almost like an LC tank where the diode protects the inductor. So if you choose an inductor and you know it's breakdown level and you have a, you put a device in parallel with that device, that will sort of naturally protect the inductor structure. So depending on your, on your circuit architecture, uh, some of it will have natural um, self-protection elements in parallel. Um, Okay, are there other questions? If not, I think that we will thank Stephen. Thank you very much for the great talk, and we hope to see you soon in Israel after things right. better. Okay, shalom, shalom. Shalom, thank you. Lehi
Bye. You too. Thank you.